So Mangalam Research Center uh, was founded 10 years ago, really. We started holding programs um, back in 2010. And uh, we do a variety of programs, but, but uh, the, this kind of program, which really investigates um, the many different facets of the Buddhist tradition, uh, goes very much to the heart of, of the kinds of inquiry that we like to do here. Um, and we have a number of different programs coming up in the next few months. The next one will be, I believe, in early April. Um, Daniel Weidlinger, who teaches um, fairly locally here at Chico State, has written a book called um, From Indra's Net to the Internet. Uh, and he's, that gives you an idea of what the book is about. So, uh, so that should be an interesting talk, too. If you're not on our mailing list, uh, please sign up. We'd, we'd love to in, uh, be able to invite you to other programs in the future. So let me tell you something about our speaker. Um, Kate uh, is at SOAS uh, in London, where she's a professor of, uh, sorry, it's from, at King's College. Uh, she was previously at SOAS, um, both in London. Uh, at SOAS, she was the director of the Center of Buddhist Studies. Uh, she's taught in a variety of different uh, universities uh, in Buddhism, in Pali, in Sanskrit. Um, and she's also traveled widely in Southeast Asia and other parts of Asia and has studied with traditional teachers there and I think she'll probably say something about that. So she's done field work in most of the countries of the Theravadan tradition. She's also the co-editor of the journal uh, called Contemporary Buddhism and she's a member of the Theravada Civilizations Project. So Kate, we're very pleased to have you here. Um, I'm going to sit out in the audience, but then uh, after Kate's presentation, I'll come back up here and we'll, we'll talk a little bit and then we'll throw it open for, for uh, questions. Thank you very much, Jack, and thank you to everybody to come uh, in this cold weather. So to give me an idea of how to angle my talk, could I just have a, a little wave of hands of people who have a practitioner interest? I don't mean in this, but in you know, a practice. No practitioner interest. And how many people have an academic interest? So Buddhist studies is an academic topic. OK, great. Thank you very much. OK, so I'm going to be looking at um, what I normally call the old or ancient form of meditation in, in uh, Boranka Bhattan, so pre-reform Theravada meditation. Um, I'll explain a bit about why I'm using that kind of phrasing in a minute and maybe if we just go to the slide we'll go through what I'm hoping to cover. We'll see. Uh, so um, I'm basically trying to give an overview because um, uh, so where and when we find this meditation, how you do it. So I'll maybe talk a bit more about that, um, what it's used for and that will give us some of the idea about why it's connected with um, Tantra in some people's minds. Um, how it differs from the meditation we normally associate with Theravada now um, and accusations of it not being orthodox um, uh, what makes it unlike Tantra and distinctly Theravada uh, then looking at the technologies of change so I want to I want to locate it within different ways of thinking about how to bring about change in um, the Buddhist and Indian um, culture historically, um, why we don't recognize it, why this is a kind of unfamiliar form of meditation for most, um, and then a bit about um, what's underlying it and the Abhidhamma that's underlying it and why it's supposed to lead to enlightenment. Okay. So first of all about where it is. So this, um, I've, uh, this is work in progress, so I've just got an image of a map of the Theravada world up there. Um, I found evidence for this pretty much everywhere in the Theravada world except for Burma. Recently found some Mon materials that are, seem to be related. So, um, so it, it may have been in Burma too, I'm not sure. There are practices that, that sort of look a little bit similar, but I haven't found concrete evidence there yet. So everywhere else in the Theravada world. Um, and the evidence goes back 
um, to the 16th century very clearly. Now, 16th century is when we tend to have manuscripts and texts from anyway, so we don't tend to have anything earlier, much earlier for Theravada. Um, the technologies that resonate with it is a different question. Those do go back earlier, but um, dating on the basis of that is quite difficult. Uh, okay, so just what kind of evidence, what sources am I looking at? The first sources I came across were from um, a mission to Sri Lanka um, from Ayutthaya, so the capital of Siam, um, Thailand, in the middle of the uh, 18th century. Um, so the king sent monks from the court um, at um, Ayutthaya to Sri Lanka, and here's the um, head monk of the kind of re revival of Buddhism in Sri Lanka at that time. Um, and we have quite a lot of manuscripts from that period. Um, so there were three embassies, and in the middle one, meditation teachers went, and the king sponsored these, temp these meditation caves, and you can go and find these still around Sri Lanka, for the monks to stay in and teach local monks. Um, and so uh, the monks went to work with the meditation masters from Siam, and they knew that the meditation masters would go back to Siam probably. And so they um, wrote down in detail, not the preliminary stages of this meditation, but the really advanced stages. And so these materials, once you've got an idea of how to get started, these materials are a really amazing resource. Um, and uh, the, these, um, the reforms of Buddhism in the kind of 19th, uh, early 20th century in Sri Lanka tended to be amongst lowland monks um, who had more connections with, um, the, with Europeans and less in the central area, which is where this was. And this, this started dying out. Um, and Hugh Neville, a British civil servant, a rather failed British civil servant because he really in, was interested in Sri Lankan culture, uh, he collected um, all sorts of things, but including Buddhist manuscripts. Uh, and he... Um, he retired to France and for, with ill health, and he, when he died, um, his manuscripts were sold to the British Museum. So from there, they've gone into the British Library, and we have about um, 17 texts from this tradition there. Um, so the system then, this is a meditation system that came to Sri Lanka from... Thailand in the 18th century, and there are other lineages, other traditions from that um, period. Um, the most familiar to people is one particular transmission that um, the Dhammakaya movement use. So there's one particular branch, talk a little bit about that. Um, and so they have a kind of simplified version of, of this tradition. So. And in Thailand, um, so they, there are also other branches and some other living traditions, which I'll come back to, and a few in Cambodia. So overall, um, it's kind of modernized, simplified versions that are living, whereas the Sri Lankan tradition of, with all that complexity, which you also find in some Thai manuscripts, um, that seems to have died out to some extent. I'll talk about that in a bit. So how to practice. So as with Tantra, you have to have initiations. This is, um, this is my shrine. And um, you actually get a, a kind of passport to the next world. This is my, uh, this, this is my kunda. This is my, uh, this represents me, this little packet here on the next to the shrine. And you, you create a couple of altars, one for your teacher and one for you. And the initiation here, this is in Cambodia. This is um, based on the creation of the monastic boundary in which people get ordained, you do an initiation in that and you create your own boundary that you have to maintain. So within Cambodia, there's quite a strong ritual context for these practices, whereas in the kind of simplified versions in Thailand, you can just, you know, just start practicing. It's online, you can do it. Um, so uh, this altar is very distinctive. The, the symbolism of five is... Uh, very important, so five candles, five, you know, leaves, all these things. Um, and you, 
depending on what, which tradition you're doing, so in the, it depends on how much guidance you get. So in this case and a few others, you're just given a word that you don't know the meaning of and you just sit and you see what happens, and you light your candles and, and, then, um, and you report that experience and then it's a kind of whether you've achieved it or not and then you get given something. So it's like a, um, so you're giving a, a kind of breathing technique to keep the focus um, and then you, um, yes, have these experiences um, and then the teachers kind of sift them and there are these short manuals that a teacher tends to traditionally carry on them, which give the kind of diagnostics of what your experience is, so tell you then whether you've achieved a certain thing. For Dhammakaya, this is um, they use a, a technique where you're not waiting for the experience to arise, but you are using consciously using an external object to get your internal experience. And so this is a Dhammakaya tradition, and what you'll um, <coughs> either the light or the uh, image of a Buddha. And um, sometimes you do it just visualizing inside. For them, it's just above the navel. For some traditions, it's just below. And this is the area of the womb, basically. You're, you're going to be creating a Buddha inside in the womb. And um, you start, um, so you start with the thing external to you, and you draw it down into the nostril and down pathways. And if you are male, you will take it into the right nostril and down slightly to the right, if you're female left. And this is to do with um, a, a right side, left side divide in all sorts of aspects of Indian and Buddhist culture, but particularly, as I'll come to you later, obstetrics. So if you're developing a baby in the womb or want to treat a baby or want to change a baby from female to Male. Male side is right, so you want the, the embryo on the right, and the left side is female, so you want a female embryo on the left. And this affects um, taking medicine intranasally to treat the baby and Ayurvedic obstetrics. Okay, so this right hand, left hand division. And then you have certain bases that you imagine these, um, you imagine you either visualize or you, once you've learned spontaneously to create these. Um, Nimitta, these um, signs, you move them in the body. Now, <coughs> historically, so in the Sri Lankan text, for example, you do this many times. So you do lots of moving up and down. Um, I think I may have included a, some. Uh, so these are the different bases. They're slightly different in different transmission. So you move them around and you do them with great repetition. And um, you, depending on what you're doing, but you might need to use the breath to kind of hold things in and keep them moving in the body. So, and repetition and combination. So, you end up with multiple nimitta, these signs, and you combine them in the body. Um, so, this one here is on this on the um, this side is a model in one of the temples that keeps this tradition alive in Thailand. And um, the teacher there is behind. Um, so this is a model for the movements, um, uh, but on the the other side is an 18th century manual that belonged to one of the um, sort of the head monk of the, of all of Siam, and he this is used for medicine. So um, so you can apply these, but you can see also the movements, and he's got the calculations of how to move and what things to treat. Um, different illnesses with. Okay. Um, this is the centre part of a palm leaf manuscript from Sri Lanka, one of these traditions, and um, I just wanted to say a little bit about the combination. So, um, you have these diagrams, and these diagrams are to show you how to place your um, the meditation the nimittas, I'm going to use the word nimitta, the nimittas um, in the body. Now these nimittas are um, also dhammas, so they're in abhidhamma terms, so they're uh, things like the, um, 
so the jhana, the experience of jhana, the far different in commentary period, we have an analysis of um, one of the aspects of that, the kind of joy or delight within jhana experience is analysed into five types. And in this practice, you will place these five types in order on top of each other, and then different aspect or different, so what we've got here, Pajara, up and out, so, and different um, types of um, nimitta, different stages of the nimitta placed on top of each other, so you're combining. Yeah. Um, and here it says, this is, um, this is at the uh, level of the uh, navel, and you're doing this once you reach the, the once returner stage. So the whole pathway towards uh, becoming an arahat, to be called coming enlightened, is uh, worked out through this, um, going through all the stages and having the appropriate uh, jhanas or nimittas uh, the, or the, uh, located in the body in different places. And at the top, it's telling you um, to place these in your navel in order and reverse order. And if we get the next slide, we can see so. And then the diagrams do this kind of thing. So you've got um, with the metta bhavana, this is metta bhavana practice, and the metta bhavana practice here is involving, um, well, here numbers. So you can represent the um, five pt in terms of numbers, or if we go to the next one, in terms of syllables, so namo putaya. Uh, so, one of the things going on here is that the an experience of, say, PT is um, being um, associated with a number or a letter, and then that represents that and is moved around with that letter. Um, I've put down letter alchemy. So basically, there's a use of symbols to convey something more. Um, and there's a process of transformation to get that equivalence. Okay. There you go. More, more movements, <laughs> how you move things in and out. This is a drawing it's from a Sri Lankan thing, but um, where you're moving things across the body, around the body, and they're all bird's eye view. So you're always looking down on the body here. So this is um, Andrew Skilton and Pibbin Chumpa Paisan have been working on the... Um, the transmission in Thailand, and this is them working out the different types of order that you have to do up and down the body. So that you can see the different orders on the right. So one, two, three, four, five, just in straight order, and then in reverse, and then you start mixing them up. Yeah. And you use the center, but then you start moving them around to either side of the central line as well. Uh, okay, so a little summary of your techniques. So first, uh, so it's a, a physical practice, yeah, a bodily practice, a somatic practice. Uh, but first, catch your nimitta or your dhamma. So um, one of the things that's an interesting contrast for me in looking, for instance, at dream yoga is that, um, so one of the ways dream yoga works, I think, is the, the everything our experience are all illusory, um, and you you can move through different states because of the similarity of illusoriness between dream experience, meditation experience, waking experience, sleeping experience, into into being, and this kind of thing. So, but in Theravada, the external world is real, and that means that the these nimitta, which are equated with different dhamma, uh, so you're basically trying to bring in positive mental states that are part of the progression, they are treated as if they are external, honorable beings that you need to invite in. So you need to do an invitation, and then and that brings us brings in a kind of oral, uh, oral sound to, aspect to this, so you, you have to invite them and you use kind of mantras to do that. Um, and you, um, you have to, so the rituals before that to get rid of the unskillful mental states include that kind of exchanging of bad karma with your teacher and that kind of thing, getting rid of them. Um, okay, so you're bringing your nimitta into the body. And it's very distinctive that this practice tends to start with those five uh, joys, which are an initial phase of the first jhana. Um, and 
so, and you then go through all the wholesome mental um, states, mental factors. Uh, I've mentioned the use of the intranasal cavity, so this is the delivery method, um, and you follow roots uh, to the body into the navel, sometimes below, it depends what you're doing, um, and in reverse. Uh, so this is just the main meditation practices. There are lots of physical practices that go with it, particularly historically, which seem to have died out. Right? Um, then you combine the nimitta in all possible ways and in mounts, um, and then you're creating this enlightenment being by basically displacing your corrupt body, um, combining meditation outcomes and self skillful mental states within your womb. Okay, okay so how's it used other than for enlightenment? Um, so like Tantra, you have both the kind of the mukti, the liberation side and the so-called enjoyment side or, or the practical aspects. Um, so I, this is um, the nun I first met when I was trying to find a living tradition of this. I, a bit by accident, I found her. And uh, the reason she's looking at my Mac is because doing field work with this is quite difficult because if you, how do you get started on a conversation about a meditation type that uses the same vocabulary as other meditation types. And, um, and one of the distinctive things is the offerings. So I was showing her photographs of the offerings made in Thailand, and that means, oh yes, this is the right practice, I can talk to you about it. Although, um, Cambodia, so Thailand has gone through a kind of, the, the reforms in Thailand have changed how monks wear their robes. So when they then see the robes of the monks in Thailand, which are trying to sort of look like the Buddha, um, they say, oh, no, that's not a proper practitioner. It's corrupt. <laughs> we can't talk to you about it after all. So I was trying to find the right... Anyway, she saw these um, offerings, and uh, that's how we got started. So, And the reason I put the picture, though, here is because of what she's wearing. The robe she's wearing, she told me in that meeting, that they were given to her by her teacher, who's the abbot, and he's uh, died, and there are monk's robes, but white for a, for a nun. Um, and so this was a sign of her achievement. I only found out several years later that it was actually within meditation after his death that he gave her these robes. So one of, the, and the reason I found her was that she had, um, she had, uh, that, at that temple, I'd come across a monk, completely by chance, come down to learn this practice so that he could perform um, funerals correctly. Because these practices are used to help the person who's died go correctly to the next life. So a bit like the use of um, um, bardo guides. Um, and so... Um, yeah, so, and he was coming here to do that, and I followed him and found her. So this connection to other realms, meeting with um, different beings, um, having very spectacular um, experiences um, is a very serious part of the practice um, in Cambodia. Uh, and these days, there's a, um, a dearth of people who have this meditation practice, so they can't do the, the funerals properly. Okay, so guiding the dead, another use. Okay, uh, it's used for, um, so the letter alchemy aspect is used in tattoos. Uh, this is um, a photograph of the back of Angelina Jolie. And she, um, but traditionally to be able to do these, you need this meditation. And the kinds of movements you do with the meditation are the same kinds of movements you do with this. So there's a kind of, um, the different movements, actually in creating the powder for the tattoo, the different movements are done repeatedly and are raised, repeatedly and raised, and repeatedly and raised. And so, um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Uh, so it's done for protection. Um, it's, this monk is, um, I've not studied, well, I've done a bit of meditation with the monk, but um, I find it quite an alarming situation. So this is one of the military uh, temples. So this monk does the blessings 
um, for Hong Sen, for example, and that's why Hong Sen has managed to become the longest <laughs> serving head of state in, uh, um, in an Asian country. So, and, um, and here he is blessing the, um, Khmer, the Cambodian troops, uh, UN troops. So uh, access to a monk who has these powers is, is um, who has these meditation is thought to give special protection. Uh, and I'd already mentioned um, medicine. So someone who does these practices can use the uh, nimitta to clarify imbalances in the humours of both themselves and other people. Um, how does it differ from our current expectations of Theravada meditation? So I put a picture of Lady Sayadaw up. He's our sort of the sort of the Pasana's our main association. One of the things about uh, Lady Sayadaw is he categorised different types of um, science um, into a hierarchy, and the types of science that give protection are low down, and meditation, um, the Pasana is the highest. And, um, and that sort of reflects what was going on at the time. So this is the colonial period with um, obviously Europeans at this time having strong, in Burma, having a stronger military power. Uh, so really control over the physical realm. And this is um, kind of the Asian mind superiority, you know, having a higher um, mental cultivation. And so here, so meditation is more um, regarded as something with a less somatic, so the, the physical aspects tend to be marginalized. Um, and the body, I know this is, uh, so the body tends to be treated as an object of meditation. I know it has effects, the meditation has effects on the body, but that's not the primary purpose. Yeah? It's more of an understanding of um, things like impermanence. Um, and so we, you could say that there's a, a binary nature to this meditation as a sort of subject and object. I'll come back to the difficulty about the consciousness in the other system. Um, rather than an external entity, rather than the meditation experiences are as internal entities that you bring in uh, to you um, and manipulate within your body. There's no systematical use of this kind of meditation for protective purposes and other things. Um, uh, and although you, for higher levels, normally you do have a teacher and do have diagnostics, it's not essential. So for these practices, um, except for the Dhammakaya, it's essential to have a teacher who recognizes your t attainments for you. Okay, accusations of unorthodoxy. Um, the early Western reception. So Rhys Davids published a text. It's actually um, in the Pali Text Society, or even though it's a Sinhalese text. And he'd got that text um, from Anagarika Dampala, who was on his way to the Parliament of Religions at Chicago. And he went through it. And what I find interesting about it is that he acknowledged the lack of knowledge about this, about meditation in the mm. West at the time. And ideas of meditation were really influenced by theosophy. Um, actually, I was looking at uh, Madame Blavatsky's sort of, um, her, she has this wonderful diagram of meditations, actually, where she's t pulling in things from different places, including from Tibetan Buddhism. Um, and so it was very hard for them to understand what was going on. And there's a kind of modesty in his reaction. But by the time the translation gets published, um, it's, it's kind of a different matter. It's, um, so translation is published in 1916. At that point, there's a kind of um, Caroline Rhys Davids and Whitmer Singer, who's, who's um, the curator at the British Light Museum, as it was then. Uh, they think it's um, a sign of decadence. You know, the, the people at the period when it's written don't know how to practice meditation because they're not good Buddhists and it's very corrupt. So they don't really take this practice seriously. And then um, I mentioned that in, by the time of reforms in, the, in Sri Lanka and then sort of t attempts to revive meditation in the 19th and early 20th century, it had uh, fallen out of use. And 
And so one of the forest monks in 1915 is looking at these monks saying, this is not a system of meditation, it's not real. Um, we get it. Uh, so somebody writing in the 1980s says, it's an imaginative, ins um, imaginative but not very insightful attempt to re revive meditation from the text. Um, I'll come back to that because actually it would be really hard to do that from this. Okay, so, and then finally, there's been lots of criticism in recent years. So in, um, so Venerable Payutto, for instance, in Thailand has written a huge volume criticizing Dhammakaya's Buddhism, um, saying um, it's, you know, not, not real Buddhism, it's um, a dharma, it's, like, it's corrupt. And, the, and the criticism is that it must be influenced by Tibetan Buddhism and that, that um, that's obviously part of a big economic, political situation, these attacks on Dhammakaya, because it's very wealthy and it's um, politically aligned um, with the uh, Shinawatra family. And, um, but one reaction to that has been for them to start searching for the origins of their tradition, uh, because their tradition comes from um, I don't know if it's on the next slide actually. Ah, oh, no, I won't go ahead. Yeah, so anyway, so their tradition comes from um, a monk who claimed to have had enlightenment experience. And so that means that authorizing it through his own enlightenment experience, it kind of obscured the history behind it. Um, and but in fact he had studied at lots of other temples, including the one that Andrew Scott and Pibben have been working at. Um, so they've, yeah, so they've started looking uh, for that. Um, what makes it unlike Tantra and distinctly Theravada? So um, there's been some nice work done. So Alexis Sanderson and Jim Manson have looked at um, the relationship between Shaiva and Buddhist Tantra. And they've shown that um, you have borrowings, direct borrowings between the two traditions. And they can show it because parts of the aspects of a sadhana in one tradition get carried over to the other tradition. So they can show it through a kind of textual analysis. So one of the things I, of course, wonder about looking at this bodily practice and these accusations of tantra, come up tantra, um, uh, is the Pali, is all this terminology that comes from Abhidhamma, is it superimposed or is it fundamental? Yeah. Um, so one of the things then I'd be looking for is a pantheon of some kind. So when you see these borrowings between Shaiva and um, Vajrayana, you see um, parts of the pantheon transfer as well. And we have no pantheon in this. This is, these are all abstract things taken from Abhidhamma. Um, and the terminology is entirely Theravada. There, it's, so one of, the, one of the really difficult things about this material is um, that if you look at it at first sight, it looks like Vusudhimagga because it's the same terminology. And it's only if you start looking closely um, that you work out, no, this is, something else is going on. Um, and particularly if you're looking at a partial manuscript and you don't have the first page that gives that breakdown into the five joys that you begin your first jhana with, then it's really difficult. Um, so, yeah, all the term terminology is Theravada, it's um, Abhidhamma, this thing of treating the external world is real, um, is quite clear. So, in terms of doctrine then, of the terminology, the... the um, what you're trying to achieve is completely orthodox. So what we then look at is, is it a heteroprax tradition? Is it doing something that's non-Theravada in some way? Um, so, um, so this gave me quite a, um, a lot of difficulty for a long time. So, so, um, so what, if we're looking at practice, then what's the model of change that's going on? How is change brought about? Um, which I think is a really crucial uh, issue, whatever type of meditation you're looking at, how, what's, the, what's going on with change. Um, uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about 
other types of other ways of bringing about change within the culture, the pre-modern uh, culture within which we find this, so Indic culture more broadly. Um, I've put at the top there generative grammar. This is, I have no idea how to explain generative grammar particularly. So uh, for those who know, so I'm talking about Parnani in Kachayana. So these are um, grammarians who encapsulated all of Sanskrit language or all of Pali language in a very compact list of, um, well, they're like formulae, and they contain codes. And this short list of codes and formulae can create the entire language. And it does it through a system of substitution. So suppose we start with the verb go, and we want to end up at went. We just start with our go, and we, end, we end, use the triggers of these code letters to start adding things and developing things until we end up with the word went. The go and went look very different, but because of the theory about substitution, there's this idea that something from go, when it's the meaning in the case of language, gets carried through to went, even though the go has disappeared. Yeah. And how this is done is um, through the discovery of zero as a placeholder. So it's connected with mathematics. And this is so important in the history of Indian culture. It doesn't just affect grammar, it affects things like rhinoplasty. So plastic surgery, very early development in Indic culture because of the how this allowed people to theorize about replacing something with something else and the thing replaced still having continuing somehow still con some kind of quality of the thing replaced so what has this got to do <laughs> with meditation well the actually grammatical terminology is used in that process so i mentioned the tattoo powder let's use the tattoo powder as an example so when you Write you so you got your five letters, number or whatever, and you're going to do tattoo with that, and you write them, and then you erase them using the grammatical term for er erasing, uh, eliding something, and you write your next line, you erase it, and you write the next line. Now, every time you erase it, there's nothing there, but no, we're bringing a method of substitution, so the qualities are still there, and the reason you keep doing this replacement and on our meditation with you know, taking these things in and out, is you're um, basically carrying on the qualities of what you replace, but you're adding something, you're adding something. So you get an intensification, you're getting all those qualities in and are very dense, so uh, the powder or your body is containing all these things. Um, and so with our meditation, we're doing it with the conditionality of positive, negative mental states. We're using this process of bringing in these um, uh, positive conditions. Um, maybe I can talk a little bit about that later. So I think Abhidhamma is really interesting and it's also really difficult to talk about because we don't have anything the equivalent. So with gr generative grammar, generative grammar as we know was very influential in creating computing language. So it's had an effect. Okay, so it was in the 1950s, so it took, took a while, but it had this big effect on computer language. So it's something we can conceptualize. Abhidhamma I find really interesting because as far as I can tell, we have no parallel and, and therefore it's very hard to think about in, in a modern way. Okay, so let's we'll go down to the intranasal delivery of pharmaceuticals. So I already mentioned there's a connection with um, um, treating the baby in the womb through the intranasal delivery. Intranasal delivery of medicine is something that has come back. It was part of the competition between medical traditions in the colonial period, and it was dismissed, uh, actually even quite early. So when, even though um, Indian ways of delivering things like inoculations um, were drawn on by the East India Company, for example, in the 16th 17th century, the, um, they didn't like the nose method. They didn't believe the nose method. I don't know why, because you get snuff and things later. But anyway, but that recently, this has become a, a 
an important way, particularly for treating babies, giving babies vaccines and that kind of thing. So it's something we can again imagine, but back in the 19th century was dismissed. Um, and about pharmaceuticals. So if we think of Ayurveda as treating sort of our five elements and our three humours, or dosa, um, and your, your doctor will work out what your imbalance is and the exact combination of medicines that you need to treat it. Yeah, so there's a kind of mathematics going on here, the group theory mathematics combinations to treat this. And so I, what I see similar here is you're treating the body, the five elements as part of this practice, um, but your imbalances are to do with unskillful states of mind. So you're um, treating the, well, greed, hatred and delusion with these pharm like almost pharmaceutical uh, substances. Um, so Ayurvedic obstetrics, there are some really interesting parallels here, not just the pathways, the intranasal delivery, the right, left, but before the discovery of the umbilical cord and um, or even after actually because um, it was believed that the gods and um, so yes gods babies survived on PT um, oh, sorry on this is uh, the joy the joy of the first jhana um, this is really interesting it comes in the people who know the uh, Aganya Sutta, the text of the beginning, so that those beings that are floating ethereally before they greedily take the surface of the earth, they're, they're living on PT. And the great thing about PT, if you survive on PT, is that you don't need to go to the toilet because it's not material. So it's very good. And so after they start eating the earth, they have to uh, have, uh, be able to go to the toilet. So babies this, in this medical system believe that they didn't need to excrete their the products of their food, so they're living off PT. Okay, so I think that's an interesting combination. I don't know if it's, it could, of course, be coincidental, but I think there's something interesting there where you've got sort of shifting between meditation and um, medicine. Okay, alchemy. This is a really interesting one. So another, I've put alchemy there, but I should probably have written chemistry. So the chemistry of purifying mercury and gold. Mercury in particular is really interesting because with mercury, it has to be repeatedly moved down into the sulfur and back again, okay? And so there's this repeated method is something parallel to this. Um, letter alchemy, so I've already mentioned this thing where you imbue a letter or a syllable with particular powers and use that to change things. So this turns up in medicine, it turns up in all sorts of things. So that's in the broader culture. So basically, there are things going on in the broader culture uh, using mathematics, group theory, um, so particularly the mathematics combination, but also zero, and the idea of the qualities of things substituted carrying on even when there's zero, nothing there, uh, and um, pharmaceuticals that resonate in the pre-modern period with our meditation. So I'm not suggesting that the meditation is taken from obstetrics or that obstetrics is taken from the meditation. I'm suggesting we've got ideas of how to bring about change in lots of different areas, and they resonate with each other. So it's not necessarily, I can't see that how we could track a causal connection, but there's a culture, a culture of technology of how to bring about positive change, and this meditation is using um, similar technologies, same technologies, okay. We've got then a kind of relationship between objective and subjective knowledge systems, between um, material worlds, and ourselves, our transformation of ourselves. Um, the language of these texts uses the same languages, for example, as treating the baby in the womb. Um, you've got the same thing of formation and perfection of a new being, the baby or the Buddha, um, the production of pure metal. Um, and an interesting parallel is, uh, again, with um, Shaiva Tantra where uh, this work 
um, so Gordon White this wrote about the parallels between Shiva Tantra and Mercury purification. There's an article called Why Gurus Are Heavy. It's a really uh, brilliant article. And it, here he's writing about the mercury the, is the male, penetrates the sulfur, the female, and other female elements, and absorbs into itself the power residing in the female. So you've got the power of the body, in the case of my meditation, but also the elements, the, the qualities of Buddhahood coming in. Um, so, and the female ones are the less subtle, they're the more gross. Um, the mercury emerges from the crucible, this is a female, reborn from the womb of the female elements. Purification is repeated, you get greater density and, and enhanced impenetrability. So that, so he's talking here about, um, I, perhaps we might think of a sort of kundalini practices or uh, practices to do with um, how semen is used in these practices and uh, how it's meant to make somebody impenetrable and pure. And we're seeing a similar parallel, not a borrowing, I think, from Shiva Tantra at all. You'd expect sexual practices, no sexual practices, but there is male-female symbolism. Um, so it, I don't think it's a borrowing. I think it's that you've got the same ideas in culture more generally. Yeah. So why don't we recognize this? Uh, I've got a nice picture of the cosmology from a Burmese um, hanging from the British Museum. So this is, I've written more on this, which is basically what happens in the colonial period where you have a competition. Um, so you have a clash between knowledge systems, yeah? ideas of how the universe is, ideas of the body, ideas of the mind-body um, duality from the West. Um, the capitulation in the physical realm. So um, undermining confidence in other knowledge systems. Um, and sometimes the loss of patronage and competition. Uh, this one's really important. So impo imposition of social evolutionary theory. So this idea that progress is all one, dire one direction and all headed in the same way. Yeah. And so being good at weapons means you're good at other things. So kind of dismissal of other. So, not, so rather than saying, well, this is more developed in one culture and this is something else in another culture, seeing everything as headed in one direction. Um, and also, I think, Abhidhamma, seeing Abhidhamma as scholastic rather than about practice. For me, looking at these practices has really changed my understanding of Abhidhamma. I'm going to flash through these quite quickly. So uh, what I've done is that we think of Buddhism as being reformed under this guy here, but actually, um, this king here, he, he banned local medicine at one point, part of his negotiations to keep Thailand um, independent. This had a big effect because these practices, you don't get your money for the meditation, you get your money for treating people. Um, and you can correlate the disappearance of this practice with the availability of Western medicine. So if we just go through, uh, so yeah, yeah, if we keep going. Um, okay, and so Thailand is the first, yep, and then, so Cambodia, the use of Western medicine only affected the cities because it wasn't centralised like Thailand, and so we found into the 1970s, we've still got really strong presence of this practice, but in the same areas where you have the uh, extreme disruption to Buddhism and practitioners and any um, people who... Uh, practice medicine and that kind of thing in the Marxist areas of um, so that really is the final blow and then okay. uh, there was an attempt to save this is um, a man who risked his life and <laughs> his children complained he cared more about preserving these manuscripts than about preserving them so he would keep moving them hiding them because he'd had this vision of the Dharma disappearing um, so there was a brief r revival after um, the end of the Vietnamese um, well, the war in Cambodia, uh, which carried on into the 1990s in um, some places. Um, but then Burmese Vipassana became available and that became the dominant thing. Next one. Um, 
so you just get a few pockets, as far as I know, um, and this meditation is very rare. Um, okay, and one of the impacts of this is that um, this use for soteriology isn't recognised, but we still get the manuscripts being turned into amulets, and and also with all the tattoos, the tattoos are still used, so you get. Um, the kind of applications for protection still visible, but the practice for enlightenment is not visible. And so it looks like you've got two completely different systems of Buddhism, one for enlightenment, one for um, protection. Okay. Um, so is this, so my question about the Abhidhamma, is it imposed or fundamental? And for me, it's really fundamental. And you can tell this particularly in the Sri Lankan manuscripts because they go through in minute detail. These are really long texts. They go through the entire path. And for those people who know about uh, the path in um, Abhidhamma, is one of the things you're trying to do is get a particular type of samadhi that will interrupt thing called the bhavanga, and the bhavanga is the resting consciousness that keeps continuity going. So you're basically trying to interrupt that. So it's very technical. Um, and it is a, it's also very reflective of a pre-Cartesian idea of consciousness. So consciousness um, is complex and composite, and it moves. It's not sitting there on the, in the brain or something. It moves uh, in the body, out of the body. Uh, so it's mobile. Um, so it's an in-depth working out of that, using that understanding of consciousness. Okay, so my next challenge is with this. <laughs> it's really tough. So uh, trying to understand how this... I mean, academically, that was really great, finding out about this bavanga and stuff. But how do I, I as a modern person, understand a pre-modern consciousness experientially? If I'm trying to... I mean, part of the way of working out what's going on is through practice. So, but I am stuck in a modern understanding of consciousness and embodiment. So I've got a big challenge there. I'm hoping I will somehow get over that. Another thing for anyone who works with Abhidhamma that I'm really interested by here is a category I've always wanted about in Abhidhamma is form, rupa, that is chitta is born of consciousness. Um, because one of the other aspects is the understanding of how consciousness changes the physical form in this practice. So those are my two next challenges. I hope I'll get through this. Thank you, I'll stop there. Well, thank you. Uh, that was very rich. Uh, there's a whole lot to absorb there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think maybe the way I'd like to try to get at it is, is what you were saying right at the end. Um, because a, as you say, you're, you're describing this whole vision of reality, this whole world view, which, which you know, then presents itself in terms of alchemy and, and obstetrics and generative grammar, and these uh, you know, connections that we would never think to make, really. but, but um, but you're really suggesting that they all come together, and, and this way of meditating is, is part and parcel of that. Um, and, and so the question is, um, as you say, with our modern consciousness, how can we make any sense out of this? So I, I guess I want to ask first in terms of the, you know, the cultures in which this is, it seems, disappearing, and then maybe in terms of how you've been trying to approach that, which is the question you, you raised at the end. So, um, you know, it, it, it happens, I mean, I think it's, it's part of modernity that we're always um, tending to, to separate out our understanding from the lives that we live. There's this sharp division. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to me that that probably, not, not that I know too much about this, but that that's probably also happening in these cultures, that as they become modernized, um, the ability to make those connections gets lost and broken. And so then there's no 
no basis for doing this practice. Is that fair to say? Yeah, right. So the it's unrecognized. So how you do it does it's not resonating anywhere. It's not reinforced in any way, um, and I don't know. So uh, the practices that exist now, I don't know to what extent they maintain these really complex practices. So I've been trying to do you know so participant field work, I guess, and and. Um, so what I'm hoping is that eventually I will get somewhere where I can understand uh, that I'm at a sufficient level or I find a teacher who's working at a sufficient level to be able to experience this. And so, so far I guess I've been looking at this from two aspects. One is the practice and as I, you know, get to certain stages I understand something more. Mm -hmm. um, and also from the kind of an academic perspective, but even the academic perspective, um, breakthroughs came in odd ways. So I've been looking at this for a long time and when I first looked at it, I really despaired and it caused all sorts of crises because <laughs> I was trying to do a PhD on this material. It looked so simple and yet I could not <laughs> understand a thing. And um, one of the breakthroughs was actually, um, I, I worked in a really tense department where there were the textual scholars and the feminists. And boy, <laughs> did they <laughs> get at each other and I wanted harmony. So, and because I come from a textual background, which is, um, I don't know, what's a polite way of saying, a bit anthropocentric, so I don't know. So anyway, so I tend to be on the non-feminist side, but I wanted to bridge this. And so I, there's a meditation in um, Bodhisattva Avatara where you have to literally exchange self and other. You have to literally sit in the other person. Really shocking meditation, really interesting. And so I thought, I'm going to do that. I'm going to sit in the feminist zone and, uh, and try and look back at this. And the reason I did that is because if you look at Tathagata Garba, there are... Uh, feminist writings that see Tathagata Garba as something very positive for women, an affirmation of women. But textual scholars tend to uh, say no, because the woman is the body that is discarded. What's important is the, gar the embryo on it. Yeah, okay. So because this does, uh, sim it's got something going on with the embryo and stuff, I thought I'd do that. And had I not tried to see it from a female perspective, I would never have suddenly thought, oh, this is really about literally treating. This is not. So when we see stuff to do with embryos in um, religious texts, we tend to see it as a metaphor in some way. So that this is about, you know, a symbol of new life or something like that or of potentiality. And then realizing this is, no, this is literal. This is really creating and treating an embryo. And then actually, if you then go to Tathagata Garba text, you read them differently. Suddenly, oh, this actually is, has more to do with obstetrics than I could, what I otherwise realize. So I'm hoping, sorry, I've gone a bit, but I was hoping, I'm hoping for other breakthroughs like that. Mm -hmm. Something that I couldn't imagine now will happen and I will see and understand this in a different way. Mm. You just, uh, I, I've been thinking about this for the last few minutes. I don't know if it's, Maybe it's misleading, but do you know that short story by Borges, P um, Pierre Menard, the author of the Don Quixote? Uh, so it's about a modern scholar who, who um, decides that he wants to write the Don Quixote um, without reference to the original work. So he's got a sort of vague idea, and he says, well, that's like the, the um, you know, that's like an author has a, a kind of a rough idea of what they want to write. And then he sits down and starts trying to write the Don Quixote. And the person who's writing, who, the, the, the person who's supposed to be the narrator in the story is, is saying, well, what a remarkable achievement this is. Because he managed to do you know, part of one chapter and a couple of paragraphs here and there. And, and he, said, he said, well, Don Quixote writes about this. And of course, that fits into his worldview. And it's not very original. But here's this person who writes the same text. And coming out of a modern perspective, it's an incredible feat of, of you know, creating this imaginative world. How amazing. And it seems in a way that's what you're trying to do also. But I haven't got the original to check. <laughs> the yeah. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. That's true. That's true. So, so um, tell me something about the, the, um, this idea of creating a Buddha inside. So that, that, you, know, you said it was orthodox in its, in its um, 
well, in, 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 its, in its views, in its doxa, um, even if it's heteropractic, I don't know that word, heteropractic, mm -hmm. roughly. Um, but the idea of creating a Buddha doesn't sound very orthodox to me. I guess it depends on the perspective. So, um, so even in the in Buddha goes to the um so the nimitta, the um, the meditation sign, the sign that your meditation so it's external, and then you bring it in, and then you have this purified version. That purified version is not a carbon copy of the external thing. It's got special qualities to it, and and it kind of has a life of its own. And even in the Visuddhimagga, then if you manipulate that, you end up with certain power over the territory and you manipulate it. And so one of the things going on is that these, the, the most internalized of these experiences has these special qualities. It's more pure than the external thing. So I think there are aspects of the process that are fairly also practice, the also prax, and also the processes of it. So you're not immediately just trying to, um, you know, identify with Amitabha or something. And you you are you are as in with Asana going through a process that's about stages of creation of this, and that starts with the very early practice. So I mentioned you know the five pieces and you bring them in, but before you get to that point, you have got to be able to develop nimitta. And so, and all the living traditions still have ways, different ways, of inducing that and testing that. And um, so you've still got to have those early stages. So I think that the, um, from those perspectives, you know, it's following the Abhidhamma path. It's quite straightforward. What's difficult for us is, I think, the condensing of these things and the manipulation of them. Um, but I don't know whether it's not orthopraxis. So, and it's making me think about Abhidhamma so differently now. I'm just mm -hmm. thinking, uh, we've been treating it as scholastic, but actually, surely all the effort into it is about change and how you direct mm -hmm. change. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I've actually always wondered about this, and, and this is not found in Burma, so maybe this isn't helpful, but somebody told me once that Abhidhamma is so highly respected in Burma by, by just everybody. And so if you go into a taxi cab in, in Burma, you'll find little quotations from the Abhidhamma and, and hanging from the mirror. And I always wondered, well, how could that be? Because it's so scholastic. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah and, the, and what you'll find is particularly things from the Patana, so the seventh text. So we tend to maybe more, be more familiar with the early texts, which are about analysis into Dhammas. But the Patana is where it all comes together. And the Patana uses this maths, this hmm. combination theory. And, and I did wonder for a while, because so the Patana is famously so long, if you gave all the mathematical combinations, you can't write it down. So it's a text that cannot be completely written. So they give sample ways of doing the maths, and then you have to show, you know, carry on with that. Um, and I had wondered about, right, so now we know how to do group theory mathematics with formulae. So could you do the Patana as formulae, but then you wouldn't actually... So if that was just scholastic, you could do that. But to, for it to be about practice, how you change from an ordinary person to an, uh, you know, an arahat, then you need it written out because the changes are meaningful, if you see what I mean. You're, you're, okay. Or you need to go through the process of each one. Um. Okay. So, so how did you, st it wasn't clear to me from what you were saying, did you start doing this practice because you felt that it was only through practice that you could do, that you could understand this? Or were you in fact doing practice and then as you got into this you, well, you understand, so. Yeah, I, uh, by chance I had practiced a branch of it bef as an undergraduate without knowing they were connected. So um, I, a fellow undergraduate was from Dhammakaya um, Foundation, and he, so he told me, but I have quite a strong, <laughs> quite a strong vis um, ability to visualize things, and it actually made me feel really ill. <laughs> the yeah. bringing all the stuff into and out of my body made me feel physically sick. <laughs> so mm. I stopped. So then the, I was working the text, and for a long time I didn't, um, 
understand them. The Pali is very simple, but the concepts are really un difficult. And I would have given up, but um, a man called Francois Bizot recorded um, the stuff going on in, in Cambodia as it was dying out. So he was there um, during the Khmer Rouge period, and I, I think it's that his um, his mother-in-law, he's married to Cambodian, his mother-in-law was disappearing off to her a hut regularly, and it turned out she was practicing it, and that got him into looking at this material. Otherwise, I would have had no initial idea about how this related to practice. And, and then, yes, and then I started practicing in order to understand better what it could mean. And so the, so my approach has been sort of both ends from the textual side and the practice side. And it, it does, yeah, so it changes the understanding. Uh, and it, but it's hard to get, when you're studying meditation academically, and if you're not going to do kind of the cognitive science things that have been going on, how do you do research directly on it? I think what tends to happen is people work on the periphery. They, they tend to, so anthropological studies and meditation tend to look at uh, sort of ideas of belonging or why people are doing this and, and that kind of thing. And they don't look at experience. And I think experience is incredibly hard to study from an academic perspective. Can, um, I, I, I want to open it up in just a minute, but let me just ask you a question about um, something you mentioned about this very different understanding of consciousness, that it's mobile and that it's, if I understood, somatically based, it moves through the body in different ways, maybe it's not only in the body. Can you say a little more about that? Um, yeah, so, so for the Cambodians practicing this, one of the reasons for doing it is the ex travel, <laughs> traveling in your, with your mind, going places and meeting gods and things. And, um, and for the medicine also, you, 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 know, you move this around the body and you can treat other people. Um, one of the, my favorite things is that there's a 94-year-old teacher in the Cambodian tradition. He doesn't teach on a daily practice, but there's a the practice I'm in is a kind of branch of his teaching. But he works as a consultant. And um, so these, one of the dangers of the meditation is that the experiences are so beautiful, there's a risk you'll get stuck. And his job is when somebody gets stuck and won't come out of their meditation, he's got to go in and get them. And so, I, I mean, I just find this, uh, I mean, obviously incomprehensible for me, mm -hmm. but I just find it really fascinating that mm -hmm. that's how they understand this uh, kind of mobility that people have. And with the metabhavna, metabhavna is an interesting one. So. <coughs> So we might practice metabolism normally by, That's you know, loving ex kindness, the extending our loving kindness, you know, mm. from us to the, to the person we're fond of and all that, and out to the universe. I'm going to spread that. But in this one, you actually go out, and uh, so you're phys so you're with your consciousness, you're okay. going out to do that, travel okay. out to the universe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um. So, so on the one hand, you say, you know, the basic Theravadan take is that. Mm. The external world is real, but on the other hand, it sounds like it's not the external world the way we think about it. It's got a very strong um, consciousness component to yes. it. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. And those experiences must correspond to a reality, so they're taken very seriously. Mm. This is so. This is not sort of so. In a way, it's like um, you know, practicing with dream the way you can develop dreams and control dreams and that kind of thing if you practice them. But with this, when you're developing it, you're not developing your dreams in some kind of subjective uh, experience. These are objective mm -hmm. things you are experiencing. Yeah. So it's got kind of a guidebook quality, these the books that you're working with. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, let's open it up.